Keys are a central concept of relational databases. A key of a relation R is a set of attributes, A1 up to AN, that uniquely identify the tuples in R. So what does this mean formally? The key constraint for this key is satisfied in the database state I, if and only if the following formula holds for all tuples T and U of the instance of R, so of the table belonging to R. So what does this formula say? That if you pick two tuples T and U, and if T and U agree on all the attribute values, T and U agree on A1, they agree on A2, they agree on A3, up to AN, then T and U must be the same tuple. So if two tuples agree on all of the attribute values A1 up to AN, then they must be the same. Put differently, if you take two different tuples, then they must disagree in at least one of the attribute values. And this is important. They can agree partially on these attribute values, but they must disagree in at least one of them. So again, put differently, if I tell you the attribute values for a one up to an, then you can find a unique row with these values. So for instance, if we declare that sit is a key for the table students, the following database state would be illegal, because here we have two students with the student ID 101. So here we don't have the property that if we take two different rows, we pick the first and the last row, they agree on the attribute sit, but they are not the same row. So here this key constraint is not satisfied. And the database management system would refuse an update that leads to such a state. So once a key constraint has been declared, the database management system will refuse any insertion or any update of tuples that leads to two tuples having the same key. If a key contains more than one attribute, we also speak of composite keys. So for instance, if you have a relation with a composite key A, B, then the rows of this relation may agree in the value for the attribute A. They also may agree in the value for attribute B, but not both at the same time. If you have two rows that agree on both attributes at the same time, this must be the same row. For instance, look at the table students. Here, first on itself violates the key constraint. We have two different rows that have the same first name. Also last on itself violates the key constraint. We have two different rows that have the same last name. But as a composite attribute, if we take first and last together, then the key constraint is satisfied. If I tell you the first and the last name of some student, then you can find a unique row in this table that has these attribute values. So this leads to the question whether all relations have a key. And the answer is yes. If you have a relation R, then take all the attributes of this relation, and this is a key for this relation. So why is that? If you take the set of all the attributes of R, so if I tell you all the attributes of a tuple, then because a relation in the mathematical sense is a set, so it does not contain duplicate values, if I tell you all the values in tuple, then there's only one tuple that has these values. So the key constraint is satisfied. It uniquely identifies the tuple in the relation. Let's have a look at another example. Let's consider the simplified students table. What are the keys that satisfy the key constraint for this database state? Clearly, SID satisfies the key constraint. It uniquely identifies the row in the table. 
First on itself does not satisfy the key constraint. We have two different rows with the same first name. Similarly, last does not satisfy the key constraint. But if we combine first and last, then the key constraint is satisfied. There's no two rows that agree on both attributes at the same time. So now that we have sit as a key and we have first last as a key, of course, also combining sit with first gives a key. If sit alone already identifies the row, then sit and first together still identify the row. Similarly, sit and last and also sit first last identifies the row. So all these sets satisfy the key constraint. But we've already seen that if we take a key and we add more attributes, it will still be a key. So in general, whenever A is a key of a relation and B is a superset of A, then B also is a key. But if we add attributes to A, then the key becomes weaker. More database states will be valid. So in short, any superset of a key is a key itself. We say that the key is minimal if there is no proper subset that is also a key. So in other words, a key is minimal if we cannot drop any of the attributes AI without destroying the unique identification property. So which of the keys that we've considered here are minimal? Sit first is not minimal. We can drop first and we still have a key. Sit last is not minimal. We can drop last and we still have a key. Likewise, sit first last is also not minimal. We can drop sit and we still have a key. The only minimal keys are sit, we cannot drop anything, and first last. Because from first last, if we drop first, we don't have a key anymore. Last on itself is not sufficient. If we drop last, we also don't have a key anymore. So sit and first last are the minimal keys in this example. In the literature, it's often required that the key is minimal. So minimality in the literature is often a part of the definition of keys. We've seen on the last slide that a relation can have more than one minimal key. In the relational model, we have to designate one of the keys as a primary key. A primary key cannot be null. In the relational model, all other keys are called alternative or secondary keys. Usually, we will indicate the primary key attributes by underlining. So if we indicate such a relation schema, then we will underline the attributes that together form the primary key. So in this example, the set containing a 1 up to ek is the primary key for our relation R. It's good design practice to define a primary key that consists of a single simple attribute and is never updated. The choice of a single simple attribute helps the database management system to build index structures and efficiently access the data in the table. The point that the key should never be updated stems from the fact that key values are often used to refer to rows in the database. So also external application programs may store these key values to refer to certain rows in the table. For instance, an application program might store a customer ID to refer to a particular customer in the database. If these key values are updated, then these external references are suddenly invalid. So we lose consistency. So if you're choosing primary keys, choose a key that is never updated. When declaring keys, it's important to understand that key constraints refer to all possible database states, not just the current one. So for instance, when we declare primary keys, we have to think about all the possible database states that we want to allow. Let's consider, for instance, the students table. 
In this particular database state, we could choose the first name as a key of this table. It satisfies the key constraint. The first name uniquely identifies the row in this table. However, this would not be a good choice because if we declare the first name as a key of this table, then this would prevent us from a future insertion of George Washington as another student in this table. A few slides back, we have discussed that the combination of first and last might qualify as a key. But this is also a bad choice for two reasons. First of all, the combination of first and last still might not uniquely identify a student. We may have students that both have the same first name and the same last name. And second, as we've discussed on the last slide, we should always choose keys whose values are never updated, because the key values are often used as references to the rows of the table. If we choose names, then there's a risk that we have done input errors. Names often contain special symbols, so they may be corrected later on. So then these references may become invalid. It might be that you have a table for which there's no obvious choice of a key. Maybe you don't have a good combination of attributes that uniquely identify the row, or you only have attributes where you're not sure whether they will be updated or not. In this case, it's a good idea to do the same as in the students table, to create an artificial ID that uniquely identifies the row in the table. So if you have a relation for which there's no good choice for a key, then add an artificial column, some identifier that is just a simple counter, so it counts 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, and this counter uniquely identifies the rows in this table. So again, when declaring keys, you should really think about all the database states that you want to be possible, and you should think about can these key values be updated in future. Let's assume that you're designing a database for scheduling appointments. So we have a table appointments. Each appointment has a date, a start time, an end time, a room in which the appointment is scheduled, and some event type. This could be a seminar, a lecture, or something else. So what would be correct minimal keys for this database? So we are interested in minimal keys that are valid for all the possible database states that we want to allow, not only for the state that is shown on this slide. What we know is that we cannot have two events in the same room at the same time. So the room surely should be part of a minimal key. Also, we have to express the time of the event that we can do so by including the date and the start time, or the date and the end time. And both give rise to a correct minimal key. We can take the date, the start time, and the room, or we can take the date, the end time, and the room. So we have two minimal keys for this database. An example of a super key would be the date, start, end time, and the room, or all of the attributes. Thinking of additional constraints that we would like to impose on such a database, we might want to express that the end time always has to be after the start time, or that the room is from a list of available rooms. We can do so by creating a separate table with available rooms, and making the room a foreign key reference to the table of available rooms. Also, we might have a restriction on the kind of event types, and we can express this in a similar way.